our next speaker is a super fun guy, and he's been a philanthropist and passionate volunteer for many years now. And um, he's been focusing on all types of people, social and physical equality. So he has volunteered extensively with Outdoor for All, working with mentally and physically disabled kids as they go through simple challenges of everyday life. He's also been the co-director at his school's Gay Straight Alliance for years. And recently he volunteered in Senegal, West Africa with the pro program Global Citizen Year, a bridge year program for high school graduates waiting to, or waiting to delay on college. In his free time, he has done cooking for the Breakfast Club Soup Kitchen in Seattle and has vo volunteered at Dreams for Tibet fundraising events. Please welcome Ariel Vardy. So, I want to start by defining innovation because it's hard to innovate if you don't quite know what you're doing. So I want to start by having everyone sort of think of what they think innovation is because I think that's a big deal to me, sort of defining what you're working with and I think it helps to know exactly what you're doing. Guess not. No worries. So in the past year, my definition of innovation has changed a lot. I used to define innovation purely as a synonym for creativity. It was to think of a solution no one had thought of, to defy basic assumption and pursue this epic, unexpected answer. But I don't necessarily agree with that now. Innovation is more complicated than that, and I'm actually still hashing that out. But I know what innovation isn't. It isn't thinking so far outside of the box that you alienate your original goals. Could you actually click for me? Absolutely, I'd love to. Cool, I'll just point to you. <laughs> This summer, I went to Peter Thiel's Leadership and Entrepreneur Summit for kids under 20 years old. Most of them were still in high school. Just sitting in the room, it was like Silicon Valley had arrived with the keynote speaker. There was waves of nerdiness, passion, and innovation. Every kid was walking around with a suit and tie, saturated with business plans for their startup company, their computer app, and their new phone app. You could see it in their eyes, in their strut, in their clothes. They felt like the future. They walked around with the purpose and articulation of the rich and powerful, powerful entrepreneur they were sure they would one day be. And there were some cool people there. Eden Full was the CEO of his company, an invader of a sun panel tracking system called Sunsolator. Andrew Su was founder of Airy Labs, an educational gaming startup that raised over a million dollars, still in high school. Dale Stevens was founder of UnCollege. Someone was working on commercializing anti-aging research. And there was a businessman, still in high school, who became rich when he sold his startup to Peter Shapiro. Every kid in there, it seemed, had an epic story. And then I found out that most of them didn't. Intermixed with these awe-inspiring innovators was the everyone else. It was, it was kids... These people wanted to make a startup more than they believed in their product. It was kids trying too hard to be part of the group and caring too little how they actually got there. They'd hold bad pitches, like the many phone apps to be used as teaching tools, made by students who did not think like or desire to be teachers. They liked the process of innovation more than they truly wanted to innovate. And that is what I want to talk about today. I would like to make a clear dichotomy between innovation and those who go around trying to prove that they're innovators. It's sort of important to know what you're trying to do. So, who am I? My name is Ariel Vardy, and I'm a freshman at the University of Washington. The only thing that really qualifies me to speak today is the fact that I happened to innovate successfully. That and the fact that I have a pretty cool story. My story takes place in the western tip of Africa, where I spent a gap year program, a gap year abroad in a rural village on the southern Senegalese border. Every time I talk about my trip, I find myself explaining my setting through this long list of no's. There's no electricity, there's no English speakers, there's no toilet paper, there's no eating utensils, the list goes on. And it was shocking for me too when I got there. But that gets me a bit of unwanted attention. It gives the wrong message. You'll imagine trying to live your life minus all those things from my list of no's. But they don't live your life minus. They live a different and equally functional life. Often it seems that the non-governmental organizations, those are the people that come in and try to help, just see the, the developing world like my list of no's. 
They try to create to make up for where there is void. So because there's no bathroom or toilet paper, UNICEF, a major organization, designed and implemented manual flush bathrooms. It was a latrine that had a special bowl so that after use, you could dump at least half a gallon of water in it and everything would flush down. This was their type of innovation. There's this repeated rhetoric, think outside of the box. But a true innovator knows that the creativity and product means nothing if it does not perfectly fit the, the situation. Innovation is more akin to finding the missile, missing puzzle piece in the box analogy. Successful innovators will find a clever way to stay within the guidelines. And UNICEF, with their very creative manual flush mechanism, failed to create a solution that reflected what the people needed. From day two or three, the latrines got clogged and then never unclogged. The problem? There is no word or flush for flush or clog in the local language. And the kids just assumed you go to the bathroom and walk away. The same way they would always and always had done it in the woods. Anyone taught how to use it did not pass the information on. Because it seemed like a nuisance to go get water and flush a toilet when that had never been con considered important before. And two months of the year water is in short supply as well. And they're not going to waste it on stuff that they don't need it for. This sort of almost innovation was something I saw a lot of by foreign bodies. They'd come in and see a village through this no paradigm, and out of pity, give them some device that tried to emulate modern luxury. What no one realized is that their luxury is not at all the same as our luxury. You need to understand the culture. You cannot act out of pity, but understanding and inspiration. Their no paradigm of looking at what they were missing didn't help. It was outside the box and in the void when they needed to be looking inside the box at the content. To all those that see desolation and poverty and suffering when they think of rural Africa, let me correct you promptly. The Fulani people on the border of Senegal and Guinea have their own way of life, which is completely functional and filled with unctuous yeses. Culture, language, religion, community, food, food of plenty, parties, fresh fruit, and well, fresh everything. And yes, they have problems, but we have problems too, and it's sort of part of society that there's problems and that you sort of live with them and it's okay. A more successful solution to the bathroom problem came with someone who looked for the puzzle piece that fit perfectly from the silhouette of space behind it. Already in place is their tradition of squatting in the woods. So Peace Corps has come in into villages and created a latrine that is literally a giant pit. This way, they can squat in the exact same way they would normally, this time in people's backyards, in similar places, except now the feces will not come in contact with other people or animals, and that created a lot of bad disease. And from a different edge of the same puzzle piece, the people are devout Muslims, and each family has one to two cans lying around whose sole purpose is to facilitate washing up before prayer five times a day. So the villagers were taught to wash their hands after the bathroom, just as they would wash their hands before God, and this made sense. This plain, uncreative solution was totally innovative. It worked. Because it was the perfect puzzle piece. Stop looking for the daring or flashy solution and start heading towards a solution that's appropriate to the external circumstance. Weirdly enough, these words can be hard to follow. Our brains often resort to our own basic assumptions and experiences regardless of relevancy. And we're often aware that these, unaware that these things are actually red herrings. I learned about this when I went, to try, went about trying to solve the problem of breakfast. Men in the villages would wake up early and they would have no food. And my brothers and sisters, likewise, would, would go to school with empty stomachs. Because of the constant heat, everyone was waking up around 5 o'clock in the morning so they could finish work by midday when the heat was unbearable. It was unbearable for everyone but the mothers who got a cool mud hut to cook in. My mom did not need to do physical labor, so she could sleep in comfortably and then start making breakfast at the fire whenever she woke. By then, everyone else would have left with no breakfast. I had always been trained that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Meal of the day. So out of pity, I tried to teach the men and children how to cook as I do in my household. I tried to make them things that didn't go bad like dried fruit and meat. I even tried to talk to my host mom about waking up earlier. It was not effective because it did not fit their customs and culture. The food I cooked was too different from what they had known and they didn't like it. And when men cooked their normal food, the wives got embarrassed and mad to see men in the kitchen. And talking to my mom about waking up earlier, it offended her. It did not show respect on my part. These things, it turned out, 
were taboo and they wouldn't have any of it. Thus, none of my initial solutions worked. It was like trying to jam the wrong puzzle piece into the hole. It just doesn't go in as hard as I try. So I stopped using my, I stopped I stopped using my own Western solutions and turned back to my long list of unctuous West African yeses. And while at a local market a few villages away, I made my first request to shadow a bakery. Later I shadowed bamboo harvesters, house builders, charcoal producers, market salesmen, wood crafters, lumberjacks, and other people not relevant to this project, like iron workers, honey harvesters, hunters, farmers, bike repairmen. I just wanted to immerse myself, learn all that I could, and it's awesome, now I can walk around with an axe and cut things down. Weeks later, I used my skills in mud construction to construct a bread furnace that was held up by bamboo I had harvested and a pseudo-innovator. The pseudo-innovator will rely on his internal box to think of something so daring, so cool that he will get attention. But the real innovator will look at the problem's puzzle and pick the best option for the problem, not for the story and not for the self. Maybe once you get rich and famous, you can use that funding for some epic outside of the box project. But in the meantime, sometimes success is plainer and closer than you think. Thanks. And I'm told that uh, I can answer questions. Yes. Yes. How much is the bread selling for? So the question is, how much was the bread selling for? That's a great question. I tried to sell it for 25 cents, and they wouldn't have it. It ended up being sold for 15 cents. <laughs> what program got me to Africa? I was actually going plan to go to Africa myself, but I found this awesome program that got me crazy amounts of financial aid. More than three-fourths of the trip was paid for me. It was called Global Citizen Year. You should email me, you should ask me about it. It's awesome program. It's for after high school. Take a gap year. Definitely take a gap year. <laughs> Did you have any uh, language problem? Did I have a language problem? Yes. The language that they spoke is not taught anywhere and is not a written language. It's called Pular. There's no English speakers and there's no French speakers. So when I got there, I couldn't speak. And then after like a month, I was able to talk. I could understand what they were trying to tell the baby. Like if they said, want food? With like a big face and they said it slowly. And then after a few months, I started to understand the language. And now I'm rather fluent. And now I have another problem that no one here speaks this language. And I really like the language. <laughs> What's your future plan? What's my future plan? Uh, any bakeries coming up? Any bakeries coming up? <laughs> I mean, I haven't planned a bakery yet, but I'm sort of a local bakery for my house. I bake almost every day in my house, and I live with eight other people that pay me to do it. But uh, I'm getting a degree in electrical engineering, so different. <laughs> Eventually, I'd like to do Peace Corps. So I think that's it. One last thing. This is really importantly about science and STEM, and that's really important. But there's also a lot of other kinds of innovation, like social innovation, and other kinds too. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was an amazing speech. Really enjoyed that.